with our decision making and then peaceful, free from fabrications. So today is the second day of the teaching, and so I wish to go through the text. <coughs> So all living beings, all those who have minds, sentient beings, have the experience of pain and pleasure. And on the basis of that, we have this extinct in instinct of not wanting suffering, but wanting happiness. So in the writings of mas uh, masters of Nalanda monastic institution, they give what are known as the four principles um, of reasoning. So that in, re in regards to the external world of things and the internal world of subju subjective mind. <coughs> We naturally have the experience of pain and pleasure. So pain is some, uh, uh, something that is unwanted and pleasure is something which uh, is pleasurable. So these pain and pleasure arise from their causes and conditions. And then there is the principle of functionality of the uh, things, and, and then um, on the basis of, and so we naturally have the uh, pain uh, wishes to have pleasure, pay, uh, happiness, and um, avoid suffering. And uh, then uh, there is the principle of uh, functionality of things, and also um, the uh, relation uh, shape between things, and then on the basis of these, we have the uh, principle of arguments or using logic. So all sentient beings, including animals and so forth, uh, are same, wanting happiness and wanting suffering. But human beings have a unique feature, which is the faculty of intelligence, this brain, on the basis of which we have a special intelligence that are unlike the animals. And therefore, we can actually think of past and future, have memory about the past and future, and we can also think about the future. A whole lot of thought processes can go on thinking about and anticipating uh, the future. So, with regard to the physical pain and pleasure, um, regarding these two, they are same as, um, as animals, like animals, we also have them. But the pain and pleasure which are drawn on the basis of our mind is really stronger than the physical ones. So it's been millions of years since the living organisms began to evolve in the world. And human beings evolved around four or five million years or so. The sun, it's said that it's over about five billion years since the sun um, came into existence, and then uh, living beings started around four million years ago, and Big Bang, the, when did it occur? Some scientists say that, some scientists say it's been 12 billion years. In Switzerland, there is uh, this scientific, uh, what is it called? The uh, CERN, where they uh, actually are able to check the uh, speed of light and so forth. For so I've been there, and so when one scientist actually described it to me and uh, with some really uh, big eyes, um, 
He told me that it's been 12 mil uh, billion years since the sun came into existence. The Big Bang happened. And later, uh, in a scientific uh, a meeting of scientists, one uh, American scientist told me that it's been uh, 25 billion years. So then I thought the scientists themselves are not quite sure about when Big Bang happened. So perhaps we, um, it's been 15 billion years since Big Bang happened. And four or five billion, uh, five, five billion years since the sun came into existence, and then the living beings around four billion years ago evolved. So all these living organisms, living beings, or and then when they actually <coughs> living things, when they actually became uh, supportive for uh, sentient uh, beings, uh, I mean, then they, there was a time when these uh, organic, uh, living things became uh, sub, uh, support for or the basis for life. So when the Big Bang first happened, there some. Uh, it doesn't seem to be the case that some um, particles could um, were able to become a basis for life and others not when the Big Bang happened. But then it kind of uh, evolved later that certain um, consciousness. So in our uh, t traditional text, like Abhidhamma Kosha, it is said that uh, the living beings um, actually started with some um, heavenly beings coming to the world. Uh, and then uh, they began to, uh, in the beginning, they have uh, their own light and they didn't uh, need any gross food. Um, but then uh, later, they, some of them began taking the, um, some kind of a cream uh, of the earth. And then um, the human beings like us evolved. So we need to think uh, in comparison to the scientists. In, uh, in comparison to science, whether these could really uh, stand to the test of reasoning or not. And so we as human beings, I mean, our body and mind then uh, evolved and um, we have the body and the mind, and mind is actually stronger. And the experience of mind is more intense than the body or the physical ones. And we have this faculty of um, intelligence with which we can think about lots of things. So, of course, we think we talk about hygiene, physical hygiene, schools systems. So we are think, talking mainly about not I mean, having good health without any kind of um, sickness and so forth. And so accordingly, we um, seek and health through various means. So since the mental pain and pleasure are more um, intense, we need to also think about the, the uh, hygiene of emotions as well. So for uh, our physical hygiene, let's take the tea and bread.
So please take your tea, take your time, taking your tea. And so we, we consider the health care for physical health very important, but if that is the case, then the mental health because it is more um, intense and having impact on our, us. For example, if, even if you may be physically sick, but if you are peaceful within your mind, then you can stay relaxed. Whereas if you are full of anxiety and sorrow and so forth, then even if the physically you may be comfortable, but still uh, you don't have um, real, um, you can't be relaxed. So the, the mental uh, experiences of pain and pleasure really have very strong impact on us. So therefore we need to think, uh, give thought to our physical and mental health of the two, the physical and the mental. So since a uh, long time in history, um, because people thought about uh, the uh, mental um, um, problems and so forth, and pain and pleasure, then people began to uh, believe in something called religion. And so religion is something that is, exists amongst humans, and animals do not have religion as such. But I don't know about the um, non-gods or demigods and uh, the uh, gods have religion or not. So since we have religion, because we face lots of difficulties and because they are beyond our own um, uh, control, then people began to believe in some higher power called God and so forth. And then secondly, as I said yesterday, the basic human nature is compassionate. Because the, of the importance of this, then all the religious traditions also teach religion, uh, compassion and love. So when we think about uh, uh, mental health and hygiene, just as we take care of physical health, just as microbes could cause um, sickness, and accordingly we take care of health by um, changing our lifestyle when needed and taking medicines and so forth. Uh, to cure our sickness, physical sickness and diseases. And similarly, it's the case with the mind, but you need to use your mind. You cannot take medicine to cure the mental sickness. So, of course, keeping faith in a higher power such as God and so forth could help. But we still need to give, deep, give deeper thought to how to cultivate happiness and in the Indian tradition there is the practice of meditation and accordingly because of this there is lots of explanation of the mind in the Indian traditions.
And amongst these, Buddhism does not believe in a creator God. And the Buddha himself has said that you are your own master, you are your own protector and guardian. So if you are not able to control your mind, you'll not have happiness. If you're able to do uh, control your mind, you will have happiness. And the Buddha says, sages do not wash away the sins of sentient beings, nor do they remove the suffering of sentient beings with their hands, nor do they shift uh, their own um, realizations or... Um, but by teaching truth and reality, they uh, help sentient beings to liberation. So this is what the Buddha has said, that he cannot gift us with um, uh, his own um, uh, realization. So because we are of unruly minds that we have, undisciplined mind, therefore we have suffering, and therefore we need to tame our minds. So in Buddhism, we do not uh, believe in a creator God whom we can uh, pray for help as such. But because of our own mind, we, create, we have unhappiness. And so we need to know what causes uh, uh, give us, what are the causes for unhappiness. And uh, we need to develop and cultivate those factors which counter these um, causes of unhappiness. And so we have the emotions, the experiences of emotions and so forth. And we need, therefore, to understand the workings and the system of mind and emotions. Some Westerners have said, some Westerners have said that Buddhism is not religion, the English word religion literally, but it is science of mind. So this is true because Buddhism is about making, uh, transforming, transforming our minds, but not merely through prayers, but by using our intelligence, this critical faculty, and knowing what are the causes and conditions for happiness and unhappiness. So there's in-depth uh, a search for the causes uh, uh, of happiness and unhappiness. And so the negative emotions are defined as those factors which no sooner they arise in our mind disturbs our equilibrium or peace of mind. And so this is called nyemong or disturbing emotions. But it's different when you're when you become slightly dif uh, disturbed through compassion, because with compassion you have a very stable um, uh, basis of the mind. Um, although you may feel slightly disturbed in the beginning, but with negative emotions, these disturbing emotions. Uh, um, um, it's different because they arise rather instinctively without your putting effort, but compassion is, arises with effort. And so you actually um, volunteer to uh, go through a certain uh, pain um, in, called when you uh, develop compassion for others. And so disturbing emotions are those which disturb our peace of mind, make us unhappiness, unhappy. So even in non-Buddhist traditions, there are explanations of these negative emotions, but mainly they relate to those of the sensual um, uh, uh, attachments, pleasures, and so forth. <laughs> so, all the religious traditions practice or teach love, uh, the practice of patience, tolerance, forgiveness, contentment, and also um, self discipline to counter these unwanted experiences. 
So in the non-Buddhist traditions, where they have meditation practice, um, the Indian non-Buddhist traditions, uh, there are practices to counter our desires attachment, desires attachment to this plane of existence called the Kamadhatu, the desire realm. And therefore, the experiences of the desire realm are seen as uh, gross compared to the experiences of the higher realms of existence, which are subtler. And accordingly, these non-Buddhist practitioners of Indian tradition um, pursue the higher planes of existence. So I've been want, uh, wanting to meet non-Buddhist practitioners so uh, because uh, when I at, uh, went to Kumbh Mela festivals and I've been actually told that there are um, Hindu practitioners living up in the Himalayan mountains and um, in the snow-capped mountains um, who um, do practice of the inner heat and uh, so forth. So uh, whether they have uh, the very powerful experiences or not, but there are um, those practitioners who may have real experiences of meditation. And so it's important for us not just to um, uh, know that there are people out there in the Himalayan um, mountains doing meditation, but it's important for us to meet with such people and have discussions with them as well. And so, and then in the non-Buddhist traditions of India, there is um, the, they have this assertion or belief in an Atman or an, uh, a permanent self. So on the basis of that, um, I mean, they, they, they believe, of course, in this because of the belief in rebirth. And, but in Buddhism, Buddha says that is clinging to some kind of independent entity called uh, Atman um, should be uh, eliminated. And within the negative uh, or afflictive emotions, there are those which have to do with in intellect and those that are non-intellect. Um, uh, so afflicted wisdom or intelligence, afflicted intelligence is the basis for the non-afflictive um, uh, and, and the, those uh, afflictive emotions that are non-views. So, for example, there is the uh, anger or hatred. To counter this, we have the, the practice of uh, love or loving uh, kindness. And then for um, uh, attachment, meditation on the repulsive nature of our um, body and so forth. So they are actually those uh, factors which do not f uh, eliminate these negative emotions as such, but they kind of uh, 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 counter them in the sense that they are reduced. And then uh, there, is, there are those antidotes which actually counter the negative emotions and eliminate them. And then in the Abhidhamma tradition, there are certain gross or uh, coarser form of um, affective emotions which um, arise through some kind of a perception of objects. And then there are also uh, those of the negative emotions which are subtler, such as grasping at some impermanence of life and so forth. But these do not counter our grasping, at um, self-grasping attitude and, and clinging to some kind of an independent self. 
And therefore, in all the uh, different Buddhist philosophical schools, they do assert uh, that of selflessness. And there's difference in subtlety of the understanding of selflessness amongst these different Buddhist philosophical schools. So, for example, when you when we say that a self does not have any in, intrinsic or inherent existence, and when you are actually able to develop this insight and experience of selflessness, um, in that sense, of course, they will not, uh, they, uh, not, they will not arise in you, so grasping at the self of a person as such. But then, um, the, um, you may still be remained with grasping at the uh, inherent existence of psychophysical aggregates, and therefore we need to overcome the fundamental ignorance of the and so the 400 verses says that um, just as the physical uh, faculty pervades or permeates all other faculties, physical faculties, um, the faculties of eye and so forth, likewise ignorance permeates all negative emotions and therefore um, uh, we, we need to understand the, that of the dependent origination of um, things and gain insight into selflessness. So one factor which actually causes ruin to us is this extreme self-centered attitude, self-cherishing attitude, which creates lots of problems and unhappiness in us. The more, the stronger it is with you, within yourself, then you also make division between yourself and others. So because you cherish yourself so much, you distance others from yourself. And therefore, you have jealousy and sense of competition and also covetousness and malicious thoughts and certain harming others happen because of this. And then on the side of the view, such as the afflicted intelligence, and also those of the grasping at true existence of self causes problem to us. And therefore, in order to counter our self-cherishing attitude, we need to um, um, develop cherishing others by seeing the shortcomings, the disadvantage of cherishing oneself alone from various angles. And therefore, through this, we can counter this cherish and um, with, um, the cherishing um, oneself. And then the wisdom realizing selflessness is the counter force too, that of self grasping itself, and particularly the, that of the um, the reality of the dependent interdependent nature of things, and this can over eliminate and uh, serve as a counterforce to eliminate our grasping at a truly existing self. So on the side of the skillful means or method, we have the practice of cherishing others over oneself, and then from the wisdom side, that of the realization of the selflessness of things and beings realizing that they do not have any true existence. So because in F, if we are able to um, develop this wisdom, realizing the, the lack of true existence in things, we will be able to reduce the 
um, reification of things and um, mental constructs and uh, exaggerated ways of looking at things and that in turn will help to reduce our negative emotions, these disturbing emotions. As I mentioned yesterday, the understanding quantum physics saying that nothing exists externally or objectively, I mean objectively, uh, is very powerful. So I've been wanting to have discussions with quantum physicists uh, so I have great hope and uh, it has not happened but yesterday amongst the Chinese from Taiwan I have um, I met some um, quantum physicists so I told them that we need to set up some time as, as set a time for a meeting with uh, between scientists, quantum physicists from Taiwan, uh, and then maybe from Hong Kong or the mainland China, and then and, uh, our scholars. So I was actually expecting um, to have a meeting next year. So in quantum physics, what they say is that there's no objective existence in things. So I have actually thought before that um, the, the quantum physicists who actually really are convinced that things do not have any objective existence out there, um, maybe they have less disturbing emotions not just uh, theoretical understanding, but someone, the people who have real conviction and, um, in it. Um, I have actually felt that um, and thought that this may be possible. So I have not received any, I mean, I've actually asked people to check um, the, uh, this, whether uh, this is true or not, but I've, uh, I haven't received any uh, information and message. But the, yesterday, Today I met some uh, quantum physicists, Chinese quantum physicists, who, because of their conviction in the um, non-objective existence of things, it has made difference in them not to have any uh, uh, like uh, uh, perception or conception that things are uh, either white or black. So if the understanding of quantum physics could be applied like we do in our traditions to apply the teaching of understanding that things do not have any objective or um, true existence for, uh, to counter our negative emotions, it seems it really helps. And it seems it helps to counter or reduce our uh, reduce our uh, negative emotions like attachment and anger. So if we could explain this kind of view on the basis of the understanding of quantum physics, then it can of course be uh, shared with other people because we don't need to talk about uh, uh, this kind of view being a Buddhist philosophical view as such. And so having rejected any uh, external existence of things, it doesn't really help to counter the um, um, experience of pain and pleasure um, uh, that uh, arise through um, grasping at some uh, uh, true existence of the subjective mind. So pain and pleasure, which arises on the basis of our subjective mind in, 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 in a world of mind, um, uh, 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 
cannot be um, overcome um, through the external I mean, rejection of externality of things as such. And we don't need to talk about past and future lives as such, but if, even within this life, I mean, I have always had this hope that uh, academically we could actually make people aware of this kind of reality, that things do not have any objective existence and uh, to, to actually uh, counter the uh, negative emotions. So this kind of um, understanding, deeper understanding of reality of things, I mean, it's no use to uh, actually apply them to kill other human beings. But if we could actually uh, use this understanding and knowledge to counter our negative emotions, I mean, it's going to be more beneficial. And so I also uh, I tried my best to make people aware of this and you, also, as practitioners, should also do the same. And through, I have had uh, discussions with the Korean abbot. I have actually discussed about how to um, help the humanity through the practice of bodhicitta and the understanding of emptiness. And so I have also met a Thai a religious leader. I had this discussion with the Thai monk. So we are all Dhamma brothers and sisters. So therefore, we should see how we can actually contribute towards the happiness and through compassion in the world. This is not about um, uh, uh, spreading Buddhism as such. People could follow their own religion, but to reduce, uh, the, um, uh, it's our common responsibility to uh, try to help people to reduce their negative emotions. And this is something that is a um, shared need for everyone. Now I'll go through the text itself. Master Nagarjuna on page two called you supreme amongst teachers since you see perfectly. He states without cessation means, uh, which means that cessation does not exist. And this sh should be applied to the remaining seven characteristics just as uh, in just the same way. Page two, first paragraph. Um, so he states without cessation, which means that cessation does not exist. And this should be applied to the me in se uh, remaining seven characteristics in just the same way. These verses resemble, uh, these verses are a summary or a brief um, statement, and the rest of the Nagarjuna's treatise explains the meaning of these verses. So docepa means in a brief, uh, as a brief statement. So moreover, these chapters provide multiple access points to the subject matter according to one's preference, and the order should not be taken as fixed. Objection, what is need? What need is there to teach depend on origination? 
The compassion of Master Nagarjuna, so the sentient beings are still harassed by various types of suffering. Thus, in order to liberate beings, he generated the wish to give proper instruction on the perfect reality of things and compose this work. For it is said, those who see what is imperfect uh, are bound. Those who see what is perfect are liberated. What is the perfect reality of things? Response. The negative emotions like our attachment, anger, and so forth arise because we, because there we there is appearance of things having some kind of an objective, I mean, independent existence, and then accordingly we cling on to such independent existence, whereas this is not not the reality of how things are. So because uh, of the appearance, we also cling on to this, and uh, therefore, if we understand that things do not exist the way they appear, and then this uh, helps to um, reduce the, um, the clinging to the, uh, how things appear. So for example, we may be angry at somebody today, and we feel the person totally negative. But then after a week, when we look back and suspect, we may say that, oh, the person was not as bad as I thought a week ago. Because if the person were to be totally negative from I mean, his own or her own side, then after a week also, even after a week, the, you should see the same. But that's not the case. And then when you become attached to somebody, and uh, later when you hear some negative um, features or char uh, negative um, characteristics or qualities of the person, and then you will see, oh, I, uh, the person was not as good as I, uh, I thought. And so from our own experience, we can see how these negative emotions of anger, attachment, and so forth actually um, see things which are not true. And therefore, when you are able to see the truth, the reality of how things are, a part of, um, which are unlike how they appear, how things appear to us, and then it will help to counter the negative emotions, to, to reduce them gradually. So two people may have two, two different views, but then one may be more um, call, um, um, a true than the other. Because when we do analysis, deeper analysis into the nature of things, we will find that the other person, one person is right and the other is wrong. Although the other person may have, may be able to explain in a very um, kind of a, a attractive manner. So what is the perfect reality of things? Response, it is the lack of an, any intrinsic nature. But for those who are in, untrained, the eye of intelligence. So it, uh, intrinsic uh, lack of intrinsic nature means that there is nothing um, um, objectively or nothing independently existing, but then they are merely designated. So if that is the case, if things are merely designated, um, then how about those wrong or cognitions which see things wrongly? Of course, they may see things wrongly, and, but then that doesn't mean what, uh, what they see is right as well. Although it, that also is designated by that person with that wrong cognition. But we need to also understand that there, to, to be um, existent conventionally, there are certain criteria that must be fulfilled. 
But for those who are untrained, the eye of intelligence is obscured by the darkness of a delusion. If, the, if things are conceived to possess an intrinsic nature, this gives rise to attachment and aversion. But whenever dependent origination appears, um, when the light of dependent origination shines, the darkness of delusion is eliminated, and the eye of wisdom sees that things lack an intrinsic nature. At that time, attachment and aversion do not arise for things that are impossible. Thus, for example, when the thought arises that the reflection of a woman is a woman. Attachment is strongly generated in the mind, craves for union with her, but when one realizes that perfect state, that is emptiness, exactly as it is the thought of women ceases, freed from lust, one feels great shame, and one blames one's ordinary mind for generating lust for something that lacks any essence. The Bhagwan stated on many occasions, monks do not bring to mind the internal female organ of a mind. Monks do not bring to mind the internal female organ of one who is a woman. Because of that, Master Arya Devas, who uh, also stated, um, as I quoted earlier also, consciousness is the seed of existence and so forth. An object is a um, um, seed of existence. So here, the consciousness refers to distorted states of mind, which gives rise to um, faulty um, experiences. Objects are its object filled. When such objects are seen to be selfless, as we um, become attached or angry due to uh, clinging to how things appear to us, then we, uh, th there is the attachment and anger. But when you see the reality, and, and which is opposite of what appears, then the negative emo these negative emotions of attachment and anger also subside. The seeds of existence cease. Master, Nagarjuna composed this twist in order to fully demonstrate that things lack any intrinsic nature. And I do, I also quote some uh, verse uh, lines from the seven Dalai Lama's writings. When someone is asleep, there is dream. And then there is also the appearance of the um, um, the magical illusions where uh, the um, certain pebbles or wood um, called pieces of wood are actually um, conjured up into uh, horse and elephants and so forth by the magician. But nothing has any essential or substantial existence. And similarly, so just as the dream, although you may be uh, you may have some dream, but they are mentally designated, but nothing can be f uh, found to be the objects themselves. And so similarly in our waking states, we have all these different experiences, but then if you really, the, the, the Sarvind Dalai Lama says that these experiences also do not have any uh, intrinsic or independent existence. And therefore, when you actually look at your experience, and also nothing can be found to have any intrinsic existence. So when I was in Bombay, as I said yesterday, I was looking from the uh, hotel window um, and see, uh, uh, looking at the traffic, um, in the street, and I th actually thought along this uh, verse from the Seventh Dalai Lama's a Song of Experience of the View, um, which says that in the crossroad of these um, six perceptions, uh, there is this hazy, uh, delu um, deceptive appearance, but then do not uh, cling to this true existence, but see things as being um, empty and remind yourself of this reality. And so although things appear a certain way, as if they have some kind of objective independent existence, and then when, uh, accordingly, uh, just as they, they appear like that, we also cling to that, but then that's not um, the, um, how things are. And therefore, we, it's very important to understand the, that of the uh, reality of the interdependent nature of things.
So if the Tagata, who knows everything, sees everything and possesses great compassion, and uh, he uh, has, uh, the, the, he has also already explained and clearly delineated dependent origination to various beings in various ways, what need is there for Nagarjuna to repeat their clear presentation? So, of course, the Buddha in the Perfect Inner Wisdom Sutras, for example, says that everything from that of those of the physical forms up to omniscience, including um, in between those of the objects and the paths and grounds and their results, I've said that all these things are empty of any inherent existence, and therefore this question is asked here, what, what is the need for Nagarjuna to repeat? And so the response says, indeed, it is true that the Tathagata himself has already explained and clearly presented the dependent origination, but now those who explain and teach such term as arising and so on are influenced by their common usage, and with minds that cling to mere words, they do not comprehend the supremely profound state of dependent origination. They think things in fact exist because they are described as arising, seizing, and so coming and, and all coming and going. They think existent phenomena are permanent or annihilated, identical or distinct. They think non-existent phenomena such as horns of rabbit do not arise. Master. So after the Buddha taught the perfection of wisdom uh, sutras, where he says no, no, uh, no phenomena has any um, self-identity or um, independent self-identity. But then, since, uh, as there uh, was the, uh, there was this risk of people actually misinterpreting this teaching, then the Buddha, I mean. Um, gave the teaching of the uh, Sandhi Nimochana Sutra as well, uh, thinking I mean, and, uh, with these three natures, what are known as the three natures in his mind, and with their characteristics, um, the, the natures of, um, which are imputed, independent, and then the perfect natures that So, following the teaching of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, uh, there were commentators like Mata Nagarjuna who uh, mainly focused on the, uh, the, the ex explicit content of these teachings, which, are, which is to say that of emptiness. And uh, when teaching emptiness, the Buddha actually taught emptiness on the uh, basis of the objects such as form and so forth on which emptiness is established. And therefore, the teaching of the profound view lineage um, came through Master Nagarjuna, and then there is the, the extensive conduct lineage of the method um, that has passed down from uh, Maitreya to um, uh, Asanga and then um, passed down to us. And so we have these two lineages. Of and the Buddha says that what arises through conditions do not have birth and they do not have any um, nature or essence of birth. And uh, and those who understand emptiness are wise. And so, regarding the teaching of emptiness that are taught, that is taught in the Perfect Inner Wisdom Sutras and others, the, uh, the explicit content of these teachings are uh, more explicated by the Master Nagarjuna through in his writings, such as the Mula Madhyamaka Karika. And so, when we study Mula Madhyamaka Karika, then we sh I usually say that we should first read 20, uh, chapter 26, which actually um, cover uh, topics which are common, shared with the Pali tradition, uh, between the Pali and the Sanskrit tradition. 
So there, the uh, Master Nagarjuna goes through those of the ignorance, that of ignorance being the root of our uh, suffering, and therefore, to counter this ignorance, um, Master Nagarjuna um, writes, I mean, uh, has written the chapter number 18. Therefore, we need to read that late after 26, chapter 26. And then the 24th chapter is the third chapter that we should read, which actually goes through the different arguments back and forth between the realists and the uh, Madhyamakas. So the realists, uh, Buddhist realists, have said that if things do not have any intrinsic existence, if they are empty, then the, uh, those of the Four Noble Teachings of the Four Noble Truths and so forth uh, um, um, uh, cannot, um, um, we cannot actually um, hold on to these teachings. But then Master Nagarjuna, in his response, says that you have not understood the purpose, the um, um, meaning, and then the nature of emptiness. But Master Nagarjuna actually says that things have no uh, uh, independent existence because they are dependently originated. And so this reasoning of dependent origination to prove that things have no intrinsic or inherent nature is very powerful. So with regard to these words, dependent origination, these two words, so dependence um, refutes that of um, non-dependence on things, independent existence. And origination um, actually shows that things arise through, dependent, through causes and conditions. So because things are dependently originated, therefore they do not have any own identity or intrinsic existence. So origination dispels that of the, uh, the uh, view of um, uh, nihilism and dependence that of the view of eternalism. So for, uh, there are different reasonings. Um, of these different reasonings to prove depend, uh, emptiness, and uh, that of dependent, the reasoning of dependent origination is said to be the king of reasoning. So because this gives the, uh, the clearest understanding of why things are empty of any in, uh, independent existence. Yes, break, sorry. <laughs> break. the question and answer session. I couldn't hear the question, though. Um, 
anyway, the answer is uh, uh, afflictive emotion has afflictive emotion has no beginning. There is no beginning to life. Uh, when analyzed through reasoning, uh, there's a uh, one school uh, views holds that if if you hold that there is beginning to uh, lives, at the same time if you hold that there is no be uh, no beginning to life, then uh, there is more sort of more explanation, more. Uh, sort of logical support. So um, the point is, when we look at, um, when we think of what comes from past life to this life and goes to the next life, this continuity, so it is, it sort of boils down to the subtle consciousness, uh, not the aggregates, not the physical aggregates. So uh, with regard to the cross afflictive emotions, such as like a desire and hatred, uh, these are also there since beginning of those times. Uh, by the way, uh, these two, uh, like uh, desire and uh, hatred, they uh, they appear to us as, as if like they are there to support us, protect us, as like our defense mechanism uh, for our survival. We need them. So that's how they appear to us. However, but, but if you let them go, uh, sort of, you know, uh, sort of go on their own accord, then they uh, create more problem than uh, they help us. That's why it is important to counteract, overcome them. Now, according to uh, science, uh, uh, with, with regard to love and compassion, uh, being social animals, we, uh, in order to survive, uh, we need a society. We need to live as a member of society. So, uh, biologically, uh, it is a necessity, it's a biological necessity to live in groups and as a result we, uh, we become social animals, uh, living in groups and community uh, as a society. Therefore, uh, seen from that angle, the basic uh, human nature is uh, one of uh, kindness and uh, compassion. This is a scientific uh, 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 perspective. And also from the scientific perspective, from the scientific perspective, um, uh, love and compassion gives rise to better immune system and longer life and uh, a happier life. So, uh, the spontaneous, uh, according to scientific perspective, the, the, our, uh, our spontaneous nature is a loving, loving and compassionate. Uh, as the first question, now the question, actually, what, what was the question? Uh, uh, yesterday, His Honest uh, explained that um, everybody has kindness, love, uh, compassion by nature. But however, we have like some an instinct to kill a small animals. Uh, and then uh, this happens due to our uh, natural sort of this latent potential imprint to, uh, so that was the, how the question came up. His Honor says that, for example, uh, small, ki small boys, uh, some, ki some, some children, they, uh, they instinctively kill an insect or a stamp uh, upon a, 
uh, an insect by nature. Some uh, immediately show love and uh, protect that animal. So these are some has to do something with imprint from past life. Next is about emptiness uh, and uh, bodhicitta. And uh, uh, if what if, what if uh, after the generation of bodhicitta, uh, how one uh, give rise to the understanding of emptiness? So my answer is first you, whoever asked this question, first you uh, study, uh, do some study on emptiness and bodhicitta. Uh, emptiness uh, emptiness doesn't mean there's nothing uh, how, uh, so if you think uh, on the one hand Buddhism teach about emptiness there's nothing on the one hand on the other hand it, it teaches about generating compassion and uh, the truth sounds contradictory it means you didn't understand uh, the point so in reality the understanding of emptiness actually uh, complements the practice of bodhicitta and bodhicitta practice complements the practice of emptiness therefore uh, uh, um, so so uh, if we don't understand that uh, uh, suffering is something which can be t terminated then um, you don't you, 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 you won't be able to develop this general aspiration to attain enlightenment so because we see we, we can see through logic that suffering and delu afflictive emotions are uh, subject to elimination then we can uh, get this resolve uh, to uh, overcome our own afflictive emotion and attain enlightenment uh, in ourselves as well as in the other sentient beings. Next question. Why are we uh, always uh, sort of uh, circling around, uh, in around, uh, circling round and round in samsara? Uh, his own says, because we are very happy, we enjoy uh, circling in the saf sa samsara. Uh, here, his own is, this is his own is just playing. His own says, uh, according to the Four Noble Truths, his first, uh, his, uh, the Buddha said, first understand uh, suffering, the truth of suffering. So, uh, 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 suffering here uh, has uh, different levels of suffering, but the most subtle one is the compositional uh, nature of the our human aggregate, uh, our human life. So that is the subtle one, and that needs to be uh, uh, ceased or rather terminated. So if that is uh, possible, then it is possible to attain uh, liberation. So uh, generating compassion on the basis of this uh, aspect of samsara, the compositional aspect of this, uh, our aggregates and suffering, that is the main practice of compassion. So uh, the other sufferings, uh, uh, Benjamin Lawson Shukin has said that, uh, you know, these uh, even even animals like cows have this wish to um, <clears throat> get freed from the suffering uh, from this suffering of uh, from the tr uh, from the suffering which is called the suffering of suffering. But we as human beings, we. Um, should go for a more subtle one, that is the compositional aspect of uh, 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 suffering. So, so most of us we don't realize this, and we when we think of suffering, we uh, we understand uh, uh, more grosser sufferings. The next question is, in Dharamsa, there are many Western students living here and studying. 
Uh, uh, due to his holiness's uh, uh, kindness, uh, uh, they got this opportunity. Uh, in his holiness's advices, the, his holiness told them to study on Buddhist philosophy, but it is a very difficult task. How to, uh, can you advise on how to do this? Uh, uh, his Honor says uh, he has a, a Dharma friend, a very, very devoted and del diligent uh, uh, person. And uh, he one time, one time told His Honor, could you please give me uh, a practice to attain enlightenment as soon as possible? And um, so His Honor said, there's no such thing. Uh, the, the best advice is uh, to study the Dharma, the Buddhist uh, philosophy, and the Buddhist path, uh, week by week, month by month, month by month, and year by year. And then once uh, uh, once knowledge and practice increases. So, so this is just like saying uh, a little kid uh, in a school saying, uh, I want to immediately uh, graduate from school. Uh, so that's not possible. So one has to go step by step through the different levels of the uh, studies, uh, study program. And uh, the same thing goes with um, physical exercises or those who are like, uh, you know, tailors. Uh, the, uh, his Honor said he sometimes uh, do, uh, you know, uh, saw clothes uh, himself. Uh, you know, he has understood, uh, learned that you have to be an other expert, otherwise the needle pinches into the fingers and it's very hurt, uh, painful. So, um, so everything has to come through uh, training. Uh, and the same goes with uh, learning, understanding, and uh, learning Buddhist philosophy. So what is the best way for me to repay Next my question. mother's kindness? Um, repay. Huh? Repay my mother's kindness. What is the best way the to death, uh, repay our mother's kindness? And uh, there's a second aspect to this question. Uh, is there something after death? Uh, his only says, with regard to... Kare. It goes there. Mother, you are too. Ah. Um. 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 He, we discuss about how to um, prove what reason is there to prove what uh, to prove the existence of past life and future lives. And he was saying, uh, you have to think about the, the nature of the mind. And uh, my own point of view, uh, even like uh, uh, gross physical uh, uh, objects. Uh, like uh, uh, physical uh, physical aggregates, they follow a, a sort of a natural pattern, like every moment leads to the next moment. And the same thing uh, goes with mind. The first moment of mind goes, uh, transforms into the second moment and so on. And it, the, the continuity or the stream keeps on flowing. But however, uh, these different stream of uh, phenomena, they, they being like mind and uh, physical uh, objects, being of uh, contradictory nature, they cannot mix or merge. Uh, mind cannot become uh, form and form cannot become mind. So the two cannot uh, give rise to each other. Uh, sub be a substantial cause. This is not uh, created by the Buddha. It is a natural phenomena. 
and um, for example the five elements uh, like five the fire is its nature is to burn um, so the so, but now this is like at a grosser level. If you think of the very subtle uh, five aggregates, it's difficult to say uh, what their real nature is. Not really like uh, burning fires, nature may not be to burn. So these are natural, uh, natural things. So my point is, uh, consciousness or the mind, uh, its substantial co cause is my, should be mind, and its substantial result should be also uh, mind. Now, the, with regard to the five sense or uh, consciousnesses, uh, during awake state, the um, when we are in a awake state, we can uh, feel the five or sense consciousness. But when we are asleep, the, the five sense consciousness are also dormant. But the mental consciousness is continuously there. Now, during the dream dream state, the five sense consciousness have become dormant. Now, there is a more subtle mind which um, experiences the dream. And then when there's no dream, the mind, uh, the mental consciousness becomes even deeper. Now, uh, in, the, in, the, in the case of like uh, karma or um, unconscious states, the person has not died, but uh, the subtle mind is still there. So, um, so in this way, there are many different levels of minds. Now, at the time of finally, at the time of death, the most subtle mind arises, uh, becomes awake. The brain stops uh, uh, working, functioning, and the heart stops, heart stops beating, and the blood circulation has also stopped and the blood stops running to the brain and the person is uh, clinically dead. So those consciousness, uh, sense consciousness that arise as a result of brain's functioning uh, has stopped. But now, now in, in India, for example, some Dharma uh, meditation practitioners, some uh, even uh, regular individuals, some people have, uh, after death, uh, the body has remained uh, sort of um, fresh, uh, hasn't become decayed. Uh, in uh, for this one case, uh, one monk in Bandra uh, Maharashtra state, after he, that person has died, uh, first, when he died, uh, he was in a very poor state. He's physically very weak. But after death, uh, he bo his body uh, became such that it became more like, uh, became better, better, uh, more fresh. And uh, and also, uh, our 100th uh, Gandhan Chiba, when he passed away, he stayed in meditation after death. At that time, I sent some people from Dharamsala with equipments uh, to uh, uh, test uh, his uh, meditation state by using those electronic uh, sort of cables on his attaching on his brain's uh, head like that. So they were uh, they found some uh, unusual. Um, signals, uh, even though the per, uh, he has already passed away, uh, there is something uh, undescribable happening. Um, so some scientists uh, uh, have right now, uh, right now, sort of, uh, sort of, uh, have started a project to test the state of mind. Uh, of those people who are in meditation after passing away. 
uh, but since this is uh, but right now uh, the, 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 the dilemma is uh, we don't know uh, who will stay in meditation after passing away before it actually happens and so we have to just wait and see so but we do have the equipments uh, always on uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 on standby and in New Zealand in New Zealand one Lama, Lama this one Lama Tutin uh, at that time his son has uh, arrived uh, coincidentally there and Lama Tutin has passed away and he was he passed away in a hospital and he was in meditation and uh, his body was uh, in a very fresh state uh, uh, usually the hospitals uh, remove the body from the hospital uh, 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 mark uh, immediately, but they have left him there. And uh, on the fourth day, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, later on, I had a discussion with Langur Rupachi, who told me that on the fourth night, uh, on the fourth night, uh, uh, he was, the, the body was, uh, was holding the even though even though the, uh, all the energy, the wind flow of wind in the body has stopped, the body has moved by itself and uh, he has, uh, his body has, his hands have moved and uh, he, uh, uh, the right hand, uh, the left hand was sort of holding the, 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 the last, second last finger uh, in his hand and uh, so how did this happen and he told Hangul Rinpoche wow what a loss of opportunity we should have immediately taken a photograph so uh, meditation stayed after death just uh, uh, in real uh, just in real uh, in reality happened so this this is uh, despite the fact that the brain has stopped walking and the move wind energy uh, wind flow in the body has also stopped now uh, now from the buddhist point of tantric point of view there are the there are the three channels left right and the central channel however uh, it seems like after that, the three channels, especially the heart and chakra, uh, uh, the, where the mind is believed to be residing as long as the person uh, is lives, uh, somewhere from there, uh, after death, uh, the energy is still, uh, there's still energy working and uh, the subtle wind is there, still there. And as long as that uh, energy and the subtle mind is still there, uh, the person seems to the body maintain the body uh, sort of in a fresh state. So as long as immediately after the, uh, that energy or that subtle mind state leaves the body, the white and the red uh, uh, elements come out of the body, like from the nost nostrils and the person has uh, stopped living. So this subtle mind uh, in Guya Samaj, uh, Guya Samaj ter terminology, it is called uh, uh, the wind energy, the wind of five colors, uh, five light rays. 
So uh, there's an internal five aggregate, subtle out external five aggregates, and and within the and the five internal five aggregates also has more uh, subtle levels and grosser levels, and. Uh, so uh, now the subtle mind. Uh, the most subtle mind at the state of at the time of death is sort of uh, 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 sort of merged together with this uh, uh, the, uh, the subtle wind and uh, which has five colors uh, so but this this body uh, the 80 um, um, uh, gross energies uh, uh, dis dissolve into each other uh, step by step and finally it dissolves into the most subtle energy. Now with regard to the transference of consciousness, power, uh, now the person, a meditator, uh, meditates on a syllable uh, uh, and visualize that as uh, um, yeah, one one entity with the subtle mind and the subtle wind, and then with the practice of this uh, sound practice, hik uh, transfer, uh, transfers the consciousness. And in in Tibet, in the recent months, we have um, some cases of some uh, lamas who have practice, who are a certain level of experience with wind energy, uh, who uh, um, yeah, just before death, he said uh, he wanted to do this and then passed away. So, so now what, what this all shows is that birth and death Uh, so, it's ma mainly controlled by this very subtle mind, which remains until the very last, and the very subtle energy. Uh, so this, this subtle energy cannot be uh, a substantial result of a physical aggregate, but it has to come through a stream uh, of uh, a sort of mental consciousness, uh, like that. So, how should I stop the need to constantly please others? How to flatter or uh, please others? I didn't really get the question. So if you do that too much, unless the other person is a foolish person, if the other person is a smart person, he will uh, stop losing um, trust in you. Okay, that's enough with the question and answer. I have a story to tell you. Uh, in eastern Tibet, in eastern India, recently during a visit there, I met a politician, Indian politician. For about five days, five six days, we became good friends. One day, he one morning he greeted me and, and asked me, "Did you get good rest?" I, his honest told him, "I always sleep for nine hours, nine hours, and so there's no." Uh, after that, his honest said he meditates for about five hours meditates for four hours and then makes the mind uh, clever and intelligent and then he used that to cheat and uh, fool, fool people. And then that guy said, um, 
he always sleeps uh, around only six hours and so that his mind is not sharp enough to fool other people. has composed his work reliant on logic and his scriptures to clearly teach the nature of dependent origination. And so um, this uh, reasoning of dependent origination is actually used to prove that things have no intrinsic or inherent or independent existence by Master Nagarjuna. The Sagada explained and he uh, clearly uh, articulated Japan origination for this purpose alone and it is inappropriate to that Master Nakajuna later clearly articulated for just uh, this purpose. So the objection, why do, the neg why do you negate all eight terms such as cessation? Can't you merely say, uh, state that it is without cessation, without arising, without annihilation, without permanence? So, of course, the things have their identity and definition and arisal and uh, cessation and so forth. But if you were to actually search for their identity in themselves, uh, you cannot actually pinpoint anything being this or that. So the question being asked is that there's no need to go through these eight different kinds of um, 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 aspects such as cessation and so forth. And the response here is those who at work it's an intrinsic nature uh, of things hold that the eight terms such as cessation uh, they are primarily taught through the influence of every day you essentially refer to things that actually exist. Therefore, just those eight terms such as cessation are negated. So too, anyone who considers reality or initiates disputes about reality raises such issues with a mind that depends on the meaning of terms such as cessation and so on. In regards to this, all things that possess the properties of arising and cessation are momentary because they arise continuously with, within a stream. As I mean, this refers to uh, things um, that are impermanent, which change moment by moment the, in, in their uh, coarse form as well as subtle um, uh, changes. And then uh, Sankhya say both essence and person are permanent. Vaisheshka could say the nine substances such as earth are permanent. Also Jane say the six substances such as the principle of motion, the principle of the rest, space, time, matter and beings are permanent. So too in general they argue about whether life force and body, fire and fuel, cause and effect qualities and those possessing qualities are parts and holes are identical or distinct. Further, the Sankhya say, those who possess the three qualities, action and gender, transmigrate. 
Um, uh, they say uh, neither atoms nor mind move. And uh, they say b both, uh, Jane say both being, give matter and possess movement. Once established, they proceed upwards. Therefore, the eight terms such as cessation are negated due to it. Uh, contemplating reality and initiated, initiating dispute about reality. So why is cessation negated? First, and arising ne negated later. I think it is logical to state without arising, without cessation. So of course, when uh, things do not have any uh, intrinsic independent existence, um, I mean, they cannot have any in independent arisal or independent cessation and so forth. And similarly, it is the case with the other um, characteristics. So in general, of course, we cannot say whether arisal happens first or cessation happens first, and then the other uh, uh, as well. But in, con in relation to a particular object like a sprout that we see, and we can say that the uh, seed comes first and then the sprout, So the response, the original order should not be faulted. Why? Because those skilled in language ascertain how priority is applied according to grammatical rules, but others do not ascertain this. An objection, if a rising existation uh, will occur, but if a rising does not exist, decision will not occur. Therefore, in accordance with the proper order, first a rising must be stated. Response, friend, give an example that would generate conviction in your assertion. A rising is earlier and a cessation is later. Objection. Anything could serve as an example. How? For instance, it is like the attachment. Birth is meaningless. Why? Because if birth exists, then enemies such as aging, death, illness, and suffering, killing, and bondage exist. Response. But something that whenever death occurs, birth must surely proceed. If it does not proceed, death, then it would be absurd to follow that samsara would have a beginning. But this is unacceptable. Therefore, because samsara has no beginning or end, it cannot be stated that birth is first and death follows. And death is first and birth, birth follows. Also, it is stated, if birth occurred earlier and aging and death occurred later, birth would be without aging and death and birth with, would arise with, even without uh, dying. Objection. But if birth that is full of such fears did, did not exist, then meaningless uh, harm would not occur, just as if trees did not arise, the forest would not be harmed by fire or wind. This is an example and response is what is the difference? And the objection? There is a difference because something that arises after ceasing does not exist. For there is no tree that has ceased elsewhere, but then arises here. And then the response is, in this regard, since a sprout arises after seed or ceases, it only arises due to seed seizing it. Objection, this is not similar. Why? Because when one has seized, another arises. Thus, when the seed has seized, the sprout arises. But since the sprout does not arise, when the sprout has seized, it is not similar. And the response is, that is entirely similar. Why? Because both birth and death also are like, are also like this. And the one who dies is not the one who is born. If the very one who dies 
were the one who is born, then it will follow that the person would be permanent and one who is a god would not would only become a god and one who is an animal would only become an animal, but this cannot be asserted since rebirth and reincarnation produced by karma and afflictions are unmistaken, thus you cannot assert just the one who dies is the one who is born and this is entirely similar. Also here it is illogical to illogical to state just the one that sees it is the one that arises and so forth. So the, um, the opponent who are uh, actually um, making the objections ask these questions with the belief that if things exist, they must have some um, essential um, identity of themselves, often in themselves. If both the seed and sprout were absolutely unwritten, the two would not exist as the cause and if effect, even nominally. But since they nominally exist as cause and effect, those two are not absolutely unrelated. Again, in this world, someone may say, I planted the seed and uh, I grew this tree, I produced a sun, this uh, tree is mine, the sun is mine. But if the seed and tree and the father and the son were absolutely unrelated, such worldly expressions would be impossible. So even in, world, in, uh, in the world, the, the worldly people will not use these terms if things, I mean, uh, 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 cannot use such terms um, uh, to, relation, uh, to show relationship because things have, uh, things exist independently and in, uh, have essential identity in themselves. But since such expressions are possible, it cannot be stated that both seed and tree are absolutely unrelated. It is stated, others are different through depending on others. If others do not exist, others would not be different. It is untenable that something which state arises and depends on that is different from that. Untenable, yeah. Oh, tenable, sorry. <laughs> Uh, sorry, um, objection. Again, on this point, if the seed exists, it will uh, come to cease. Since if it did not exist, it will not come to a cease. Therefore, here, rising is earlier and cessation later. So the uh, passage, the last passage on page number five. Therefore, since neither arising or ceasing cannot be posited as early or later, why is it inappropriate to criticize the statement cessation is negated first, arising is negated later? Because it is clearly taught that those who cannot be posited, uh, those two cannot be posited as earlier or later. You should investigate why Masanagarjuna here states cessation first and arising later, and then. The objection first demonstrate how the term arising is mere convention. We shall now. So the Prasankhika Mademakas say that things like arising and so forth are merely in name. So someone asked this to demonstrate it, and the response, we shall now set this out fully, nor from, uh, not from itself, not from others, not from both, not without a cause, never in any way does anything arise. In this regard, if something were to arise, that thing would arise from itself, or? So just as things appear to us, if there were to be a seed or cause which independently arises, given rise to its effect, which also arises independently, and the arisal itself, the action also, um, and if it has any independent existence. So um, just as appears, that is not the case. Um, or from others, or from... Others here refer to, uh, for example, the sprout and its seeds being independently separate or different, and from both uh, itself and others, and without a cause. 
So since things do not arise from itself nor another, they do not have I mean, arisen from both itself and others, and then also without any causes. So the opponent's view is that things must exist the way they appear to us, as if, and which is to say that things appear to us as if they have some independent objective existence. And then with that assertion, they're asking these questions. But if we examine these alternative, non, uh, alternatives, none are tenable. Why? So when we, the term from itself ultimately means from its own self. First, a thing does not arise from its own self because each ari such arising would be pointless and further such arising would be endless. So if things arise from itself, then a thing arises from itself such as the, what the Sankhya say that the effects, the sprout, for example, is a manifest um, uh, effect, whereas there is also within the seed an unmanifested sprout. So they say that uh, there must be some compatible uh, factor for the sprout to arise, otherwise uh, it cannot arise. So therefore they say within the seed that compatible factor is there intrinsically. So with, with uh, regard to our body, even to the number of the um, hairs on our body, I mean, um, uh, said to I mean, have a dear uh, seed or some, um, some kind of a seed within the chromosome. So the different features of uh, our body are said to have their seeds within uh, the, uh, the chromosome. And so the Sankhyas say that, that this, with the, this uh, sprout within the seed itself is called unmanifested sprout. Blueprint. Blueprint. Unmanifested. Uh, uh, chromosomes blueprint, yeah. So if the uh, sprout or the effect were to exist at the time of the course itself, then the birth itself is pointless. So on the one hand, they think that things have some true intrinsic existence. And then on the other hand, they also say that the, the effect uh, the, um, is within the cause itself as well as unmanifested and unmanifested of, uh, aspect. As such, things which exist in and of themselves do not need to arise again. But if something which already exists needs to arise again, then it would never not need to arise. But this is untenable. Therefore, first, no, th no thing arises from itself. So this is rejection of arisal from self. And so in, with regard to this, um, particular um, uh, statement, there is objection from Bhav Viveka, Master Bhav Viveka, and to that objection from Bhav Viveka, Master Chandrakirti in his Prasanapada um, um, uh, called uh, response. So Bhav Viveka's uh, lamp of wisdom contains that criticism. Also, they do not arise from others. Why? Because it would follow that anything would arise from anything. They do not arise from both itself and other because it would then follow that both previous errors would apply. Also, they do not arise without a cause because it would follow that anything would continuously arise from anything. And in consequence, the error that the entire causal process would be pointless would ensue. 
So if you uh, investigate into the, the, the um, process of arising uh, from itself or um, others and, and other or both self and other and consciousness, I mean, nothing can be found um, when you do um, search for this kind of arisal. So of course, in conventional terms, ar uh, arisal and cessation do exist. Thus, because it is not uh, tenable that a thing arises in any of these ways, the term arising is merely convention, since there is no arising. So in the Madhyamaka Avatara, it says that things have no as, uh, existence from their own side. And similarly, Master Tsongkhapa gives this reasoning. So when we actually analyze things, whether they have an, an own existence or um, essential um, identity or not, um, they do not, we cannot find such thing. And therefore, uh, things should, we should not go beyond the worldly convention uh, to uh, posit things. And so there is this uh, um, argument between the, uh, the realists and the prasangikas or madhyamakas whether there is uh, the commonly um, called, uh, accepted uh, object or not. And uh, in uh, Tsongkhapa's, Master Tsongkhapa's commentary on Malamadimaka Karika, he says that things do not have um, in, in the essence of true eloquence, he says that things either could exist um, by way of the designation or they could exist by, uh, from their own side. And since they cannot uh, call, uh, exist from their own side, there's no other alternative but to say that things exist by designation. And in the uh, Mulemadimaka commentary by Ch uh, Master Stonkapa, he says that uh, since there is no other choice, we should drive our mind towards that insight. And then in his commentary to um, Madhyamaka Avatara, he says that to the, the assertion that things are merely designated is the most difficult point to uh, comprehend in the Madhyamaka's uh, philosophical tradition. So having um, rejected any and all um, object of negation um, when we establish emptiness, and um, the, having done that, um, then uh, you will be able to see that things are merely designated and um, uh, merely in name. Otherwise, until you are able to uh, reject the subtlest uh, form of object of designation, you will not be able to have that uh, uh, insight into the uh, mere uh, nominality of things. So, objection, we admit the first three points, things do not arise from themselves, so how then could a sprout arise from itself? If a thing does not arise from itself, it is illogical that it arises from uh, itself and others, since one part of this thesis would fail, and the proposition arising without a cause cannot be accepted since it is absurd. But you strictly maintain the uh, position that uh, things never arise from others, but how can this position be justified? So the um, 
uh, says so, so the objective says that uh, the four conditions are causal condition and the uh, objective condition immediately preceding condition and the dominant condition a fifth does not exist so because these do exist we do we can talk about them they say since it is the, that a fifth does not and exists, this indicates that David Hama Master strictly maintained that any condition, even those conventionally described as different from the four conditions, must be included within the four conditions. In order to fully settle the issue, these masters teach these four conditions, such as the causal condition, to be the con conditions generating things, for things, um, things arise from these four conditions alone. Thus, because things arise from the four conditions, which are the other, uh, therefore, it is unsound to assert things never arise from others. And the response says, if you designate any of the four conditions, such as the causal condition as other, and if they were something other than things, um, they, then things would arise from others. But it is untenable to say that they are, uh, they are other in what way. The intrinsic nature of things does not exist in the conditions and so on. If things own, if its own intrinsic nature does not exist, the intrinsic nature of others does not exist. Here, existence, th existent things may be described as others since one thing relies on another, just as, for example, Gupta is other than Chaitra and Chaitra is other than Gupta. At the time when conditions such as seed exist, then all at that at that time, a thing such as sprout does not exist. Therefore, when conditions such as the causal condition and so on exist, the intrinsic nature of things such as sprout does not exist. If its own nature, intrinsic nature does not exist, then how could the intrinsic nature of others such as its causal conditions exist? That being so, it is untenable that conditions such as the causal condition and other things uh, such as sprout. So when we talk about uh, something uh, that is called other, there should be something in, in relation to which it is an other thing. Therefore, it is untenable to state things arise from others because others are definitely non-existent and so on is stated in conditions and so on. So to reject this arisal from another um, uh, is um, in, we, in, in order to understand uh, this well, I mean, um, we need to gain in a good understanding of the Madhyamaka um, view of emptiness. And, and then there are those, because of the, subtle, um, uh, the subtlety, there are those who say that uh, non-arisal um, uh, from other itself is also emptiness. Then objection, if conditions such as form and so on exist, then uh, doesn't consciousness arise? The response, that is not so. Let's investigate the arising of things. If you assert that consciousness that has not arisen arises from conditions that are other than it, then how could consciousness which has not yet arisen possess an intrinsic nature? If its own intrinsic nature does not exist, how could the intrinsic nature of other ex exist? If the intrinsic nature of others does not exist, then sprout and so on would be the same. Again. There is an alternative meaning. The essential nature of a thing does not exist in its condition. It does not exist in those that are other than, other than its conditions. Also, it does not exist in both. Why? Because to take them as conditions of further arising of others is flawed, for it is pointless. Thus, if the intrinsic nature of things exist in conditions and so forth, so if things were to have a, a rising or birth, were to have any intrinsic existence uh, from its own side, then there's no need for it for us to say things arise in, in, uh, because it is already there. A reason. No.
So we need to posit something that helps something in relation to that which is helped. So therefore, as long as there is a, an effect which is helped and um, brought about by the, uh, that which helps to br bring it about, the cause, therefore we can say the cause is there. So when the sprout, when this uh, effect has arisen, and uh, then uh, the cause doesn't have to work to give rise to it. So, and when we do this kind of analysis, it's uh, as if trying to find arguments, uh, what kind of arguments we can actually make. So all these uh, the, uh, chapters of Malamadhyamaka Karika does this kind of analysis, whether things have, uh, 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 when things are born intrinsically or what, and so forth. So things do exist, arising and so forth are there, but then when you actually check whether things arise from itself or others or both or uh, causelessly, I mean, nothing can be found to have to arise uh, from these factors. And therefore, we can meditate on emptiness and when we say Om Swabhava Mantra, also considering them to be conditions would be pointless. That being so, it is said the intrinsic nature of things does not exist in the so, um, page number seven, last paragraph. So, thus, if the intrinsic nature of things exists in its conditions, or the, um, those other than its conditions, and in both, uh, then what use is there for something already exists to arise? It would be pointless to consider the things that exist inherently need to, uh, to arise again. What use are conditions for something which already exists? Also, considering them to be pointless, what would be pointless? Conditions would be pointless. That being so, it is said, the intrinsic nature of things does not exist in conditions and so on. Therefore, that which does not exist in conditions and so on has no own nature because it can never be con considered apart from them. It was also said, if its own intrinsic nature does not exist, the intrinsic nature of others does not exist. Therefore, if intrinsic nature of others um, does not exist, who can say that things arise from the intrinsic nature of others? What is the use? What use is it for you to ask what, uh, what things arise from themselves or others and so on? For the eye and so forth are conditions that act to... Con so here the act of arising is generated, giving rise to and producing it that primarily established consciousness. Um, consciousness is something that arises, the I and so on, to on accomplish the action of giving rise to consciousness and so forth. And then the response, it is not that actions possess conditions. So things, it is said that things arise from conditions such as the dominant or empowering condition and so forth. And because there is the condition, there is also cause, and because of cause, there is conditions. You may say that because the eyes and so on accomplish the act of giving rise to consciousness, they are conditions on, of consciousness, and they also give rise to name of consciousness. But if we investigate such action, then this is untenable. For how could the eyes and so on establish consciousness? Why this is untenable? Because we may ask whether, in your explanation, the act of giving rise to consciousness establishes a consciousness that has already arisen or consciousness that has not yet arisen. First, it does not establish 
Consciousness that is not arisen because that is impossible. Thus, the act of arising establishes an existing consciousness and it does not establish that which does not exist. For consciousness has not arisen, does not exist. If it does not exist, then how could the act of giving rise to consciousness be something that exists? It does not establish the act of gay. Again, giving rise to consciousness that has already arisen. Why? Because that consciousness has already arisen and that already arisen does not need to arise again. So things, when we do not do this kind of analysis, whether they arise from self and so forth, and we can actually talk about arising the action, the agent and so forth, can be posited. The law of causality can also be posited when we don't do this kind of analysis into their nature of reality. But when you do this kind of analysis, then nothing can be found to have arisal or cessation and causality and so forth. And so why can we not find when we do this kind of critical analysis into the nature of things is because they are designated. And this actually counters our grasping and clinging to the some kind of uh, independent existence in things just as they appear because clinging to this independent existence gives rise to the negative emotions anger attachment and so forth and then we disturb our peace of mind but understanding of emptiness is the best health care um, uh, factor or um, the principle for health care uh, but if you think that the act of giving rise to consciousness exists for consciousness now arising, then that also is not possible. Why? Because not only does the arise, does arisen and non-arisen consciousness not exist, but that now arising does not um, exist, since it has already been demonstrated that the act of arising does not establish either that which has arisen or not arisen. Therefore, the act of arisen does not exist. The reasoning also refutes the act of cooking. Thus, it is not tenable that actions possess conditions. But if you think that there is action that does not possess conditions, then there is no action that not possessing conditions. If, in fact, there is, in fact, there is no action uh, that does not possess conditions for if such action were to exist, then all things would continuously ris arise from all things. If that were so, the causal and then there is an objection and then response, those that not possessing action are not conditions. Anything that lacks action is not a condition. How? If the I and so on are asserted to be conditions of consciousness, then since they accomplish the act of giving rise to consciousness, then it is already been it has already been clearly demonstrated that the act of giving rise to consciousness is untenable. If something does not exist, how could if something doesn't exist, how could that uh, which establishes it exist? Because the uh, agent that establishes consciousness does not exist, the I and so on, and conditions that um, act to give rise to consciousness, if they are not conditioned, the act of giving rise to something, how could they be conditioned? But if they were, then anything would be conditioned for anything. If that were so, then everything would arise from everything else. And, but that cannot be so because those not possessing action are not conditions. Why should I say that conditions do not act, uh, possess action? Actually, conditions definitely possess action. How could they possess action? The response. This is applied in the context of stating not, for conditions do not possess action. How? Now, it has already been clearly demonstrated that it is not that actions possess conditions and there is no action not possessing conditions. But if there is no action, how could conditions come to possess action? Thus, because conditions 
Conditions that do not possess action are untenable, since conditions that possess action also do not exist. Therefore, considering them to be conditions is pointless. And then the objection and the response. The verse, if they are called conditions, because things arise and depend on them, then for as long as things do not arise for that long, why, why aren't they non-conditions? If you say that they are all conditions, because things arise in dependence on them, then why not also assert as for as long as things do not arise for that long, they are not conditions, non-conditions. But if you think that they are not conditions before, but became conditions later, then that also is untenable. Why? Because in consequence, they would become the conditions of everything, and this also is unacceptable. And then the next verse, conditions are not tenable for, non, for non-existent or existent object. If non-existent, what would they be the conditions of? If existent, what would it conditions, its conditions are, do? If you say that the relationship expressed by the words that arises and depends on this indicates this is a condition of that object, then the relationship expressed by the word this and that should be considered to be either the condition of an existent or non-existent object. However, it is not tenable that something is a condition of non-existent or existent object. How? If non-existent, what would they be the conditions of? If existent, what would its conditions do? If you consider the conditions uh, of non-things, then how would you respond to the question, this is a condition of that? If, in fact, it is illogical to say threat is a condition of non-existent cloth. Objection. Since cloth arises from threats, that, uh, that is its cause. It is appropriate to say that cause of threat is a condition of cloth due to the cloth arising after the threat. Response, do you wish to entice a mother of your unborn son with your unborn son's wealth? We have said that things which lack conditions are untenable, and we have denied that things arise since conditions are not tenable. But you assert conditions are established since future things arise. However, things do not arise in, at any time or any place, if, even intermittently, for it's, it is said. If non-existent, what would it be the conditions of? For you, the, when conditions exist, then things will arise late, uh, later arise, and conditions are established in reliance on this. But how could this be? Therefore, it is flawed logic. But if you think that something is conditioned for something which exists, then it was said, if existent, what would con its conditions do? So conditions are untenable uh, for things which already exist. For how would the conditions act on existing things? It is illogical to uh, declare uh, the causal threat is a condition of cloth that is already established and exists. And then the objection. I do not say the action of conditions for that which has already arisen, but causal threat is a condition of cloth, since threat that is caused, that is, its cause is designated as a condition of cloth that already exists. And the response, do you think that before you take a wife, your son's wife exists? The arising of a thing has been refuted since it is untenable that a thing arises, yet still you wish to demonstrate its condition, a condition that has generated cloth, and then the objection. But for the purpose of establishing that thing arise, things arise, it is untenable to say that one first spins thread and then later this was a condition for that cloth response. But this also is flawed logic. Objection. Things are established from their characteristics. And a statement, a cause is that which establishes its effect, reveals the defining uh, characteristic of a cause. Therefore, causes that possess characteristics exist. 
in the response when no phenomena, whether existing, non-existent, non, uh, nor existing, nor uh, non-existent, are established, how could that which establishes them be called a cause? If that were so, it would be illogical. An objection here: when the phenomena are established by their causes, those which are established are either existent, non-existent, both existent and non-existent. And the response is, but this is not tenable at all. First, those which exist do not need to be established because they have already arisen. Why should those which, had, which have already arisen arise again? If something that already exists needs to arise again, it would never not need to arise, but this is unacceptable. Also, teaching something to be their cause is untenable for if the effect exists, what would a cause do? Thus, those that now already exist do not need to be established. And the second? So, it's on this, uh, the, when we are on page number 13, thus if phenomena do not have focal objects, how could the focal objects exist and so forth? And then the objection. You wrongly conceive this uh, through not understanding our textual system. So textual system, um, we do not say that that which has a focal object possesses the focal object like possessing wealth, but this means is the... Uh, is that mental phenomena are objects um, established by a basis, and that is the focal object. Therefore, this clearly demonstrates that they possess a focal object that is untenable, and the same response again applies to it. Thus, if phenomena do not have focal objects, how could the focal objects exist? Thus, if mental phenomena do not have focal objects, they do not exist and they are not established. How could it be tenable that focal objects exist? Also, the term focal object of phenomena would never be actually established. How could that which is not actually established and therefore non-existent be an existent focal object? If focal objects do not exist, how could existent phenomena be established by focal objects? Therefore, focal objects do not exist and also ex existent phenomena never possess focal objects immediately preceding conditions objection uh, phenomena that has just ceased is conditioned for the arising of another phenomena it is called immediately preceding condition and it exists and the response if phenomena have not arisen cessation is not attainable because of the immediately preceding condition is illogical if it has ceased how could it also be conditioned those last two lines of roots verse should be reversed if it has ceased how could it also be conditioned so the last paragraph on page 14, cessation means non-existent. If the seed were to cease prior to the rising of a sprout, if the seed was non-existent since it has ceased, then how could that seed be something which generates a sprout and the condition of it? Moreover, what is the condition for the seed ceasing? How could a seed that has ceased and is non-existent act as a condition which gives rise to a sprout? How could a seed that has ceased be a condition of a sprout that has not arisen yet? That being so, if you conceive that sprout arises after the seed has ceased, then it would follow in consequence that both states would be costless. But being costless is not acceptable. If the seed were to cease immediately before the sprout arose, then it would be established as an immediate preceding condition because immediately before the sprout arises, it acts as a condition for the seed ceasing. That is not also not uh, untenable. Why? Even if it arose, 
how would it act as a condition if the sprout arose? And if the seeds, seed seized at the completion of the act of giving rise to the sprout, then what would be the condition for it to, to seize? Also, how would it be a condition for giving rise to the sprout? Therefore, as before, it would follow that both would be costless. And then the next uh, paragraph again, there is uh, an alternative meaning. It has already been established that things, not, uh, things are unarisen. Therefore, it is established that the arising of things does not exist, for it is said, if phenomena have not arisen, cessation is untenable. Things have not arisen, and if non-existent, um, the cessation is untenable. How could non-existent things come to cease? Because of that, the immediately preceding condition is illogical. Thus, because the cessation of things not, is not tenable, therefore, an immediately preceding condition is illogical. But even when you consider that which has ceased, it cannot be immediately preceding condition. And then next is the uh, rejection of dominant condition. Also, regarding that which has um, a reason for how could it become a condition, the meaning of it is, has been explained previously. And then the dominant condition, objection, the dominant condition exists, a dominant thing is dominant condition. Further, uh, br uh, in brief, whatever exists and whatever arises and whatever does not exist and whatever does not arise is a dominant condition. Because things of devoid of inherent nature are not existent, the statement, if this exists, that arises, is not tenable. So this uh, phrase, this existing and that exi arising, can be, of course, asserted and conventionally, but when you try to look for the existence and this existing and that arising, and, and looking for something that you can find as an essential um, nature of it, then you cannot find them. Here, it was mentioned before and extensively demonstrated later that an inherently is as inherent essence of things does not e uh, exist. Therefore, having clearly established this, Nagarjuna declared that things are devoid of inherent nature. That's because the th existence of things described in terms of the ex uh, the. Um, the existence of things devoid of inherent nature is not tenable, therefore things can not be described in terms of if this exists, that arises, and so forth. So from the point of view of anal analysis on, of arising or of things, functioning things, um, whether they um, have the, uh, arise through the four conditions or not, I mean, ultimately, in the ultimate um, perspective, there is uh, no um, conditions. So indeed we cannot say the things conditions is, are established, that things which are conditions are established in this way, but conditions do exist. Why? Because effects arise from them. In this world we see that effects such as sprout arise from conditions such as seeds and so on. Because of the, that we understand they are conditions uh, generating effects, since effects are seen to arise from them. Response, the effect does not exist at all in those individual or assembled conditions. How could something which does not exist in those conditions arise from them? The term at all means ever. As such, the effect never exists in its individual conditions. Also, it never exists in its assembled conditions. 
If it is untenable for you to demonstrate in any way that effects arise because these their, because their conditions are fully established, then how could conditions be established? How? Because the effect does not exist at all in those individual or ensemble conditions. How would how could something which does not exist in those individual or ensemble conditions arise from them? If the effect does not arise, how could you assert its conditions are established? But if you think that effects only exist in those conditions, then conditions are untenable because if those effects exist, then action by those conditions would not exist. That is because those effects have already arisen and it is unnecessary they arise repeatedly. Furthermore, if the effect exists in those conditions, does, does the effect uh, of multiple conditions exist as a final complete state in each condition, or does one part exist in each? First, if, effect, if, an, if the effect is con considered to exist as a final complete state in, which, in each condition, then there would not be multiple conditions. Also, because the effect would exist in each condition, then it would follow that the effect would arise from each without a reliance on other conditions, however, if one imagines that part of the effect exists, that part of the effects and the effect exists in the condition, then it would follow that part of the effect would arise from each condition without reliance on other conditions, and this is unacceptable. Because of that, it is untenable that an effect exists in conditions, either individually or when assembled. But if you think that those effects does not exist and conditions still it arises from conditions and its conditions are fully established in reliance on their effects arising, then we shall respond to this. But if it arises from this, those conditions when they do not exist, then why doesn't it also arise from those which are not conditions? So Arya Deva says on page 18, if cloth is established from its causes and its causes also established from others, how could something not established from itself by itself um, produce something another? Thus, due to the reason that conditions are not established, uh, self-established, they are not dri derived from themselves and lack an intrinsic nature. Because of that, they do not arise from conditions. Effects do not arise from conditions, but if you think that effects arise from non-conditions, then effects derived from non-conditions do not exist. If it is untenable, untenable that cloth is derived from the threat that it um, that is its cause. That is its cause. Then to state cloth is derived from herbs would contradict the view of the world. How could this be tenable? Because of that, effects derived from non conditions also do not exist. Objection. Conditions also exi uh, alone exist. Why? Because there, there are definitely either conditions or non conditions. Seeing that there are definitely only conditions and non conditions, therefore, grain oil, grain oil is also only derived from grain, but uh, not, is not. Butter is derived from cream alone, grain oil is not, and neither is derived from sand. Thus, because it is said that these conditions are those, uh, these are the conditions of those, these are not conditions for those. So when we when we search for the essential identity um, and of the cause and effect and so forth, I mean, nothing can be found uh, within that designated object, from within the designated object. So this completes the first chapter called Examination of Conditions. I'll stop here for today.
Through the coming of the Buddha in this world and giving teaching and through the harmon harmonious living of the monastics, may the Dharma flourish for a long time.